Hey, everyone. Good afternoon. Thanks for making it down to GDC Narrative Summit Day 1. Um, I'm guessing that you're all that game company fans, maybe? Yeah. <laughs> um, thanks for making it down, everyone. Um, uh, I feel like I'm presenting this slightly prematurely. We did actually have a big beta uh, release recently, but I wanted to do a quick sense check before I dove into the presentation to see how many of you guys have actually read or seen or even played a uh, new game, Sky. Oh, a handful. Okay, great. Okay. Um, for, for, for the rest of you guys in the room, there's actually a lot of surprises that I won't be covering um, in this talk today, so uh, don't be afraid. Don't shut your ears down when there's, you know, spoilers um, in the presentation. I think that uh, hopefully every, everyone in this room will walk away with something um, as well. So let me make a start. So my name is Jenny Kong. Uh, I am the story writer at That Game Company Studio based out in Santa Monica. Um, and I'm really thrilled to be sharing with you the presentation Evolving Emotional Storytelling in Our New Game Sky. For those who don't know me, uh, I'm also a narrative writer for a couple of indie studios who are showcasing the games out here at GDC this week. Um, and most recently, I actually directed and shot a docu-series uh, around uh, storytelling uh, in video games. Uh, it follows uh, 15 iconic and indie game creators, and it's currently streaming on Comcast and YouTube if you haven't had the chance to check it out yet. Um, and just taking a, a step even further back, uh, I've been working in the video games industry for around 15 years or so now. I began my career on the publishing side back at Sony PlayStation UK, working on a number uh, of titles there. So I've been working at that game company since 2013. Um, Sky, the, uh, the new game, is probably the studio's most ambitious project to date. Uh, I would say that because not only are we developing the game, but we're also publishing the game uh, for the most part as well. We announced the title back in uh, late 2017 uh, at the Apple keynote stage, and over the past year we've been aggressively beta testing two key components of the game, the multiplayer aspect and also the emotional aspect. We want to get both of these right. Uh, I think we're in the home stretch now. We're nearly finished with the game and, and ready to, to kind of launch the global release. Um, but I, I'm so passionate about this area that I feel that over the past decade, uh, emotional storytelling has really seen um, some highlights over the past few years, um, primarily in the linear game experience. Uh, and what I hope today we'll do is to offer additional conversation to explore emotional storytelling in the multiplayer uh, domain as well. So I would say that Sky is a spiritual successor to some of the previous games that the studio have made. Um, I studied screenwriting at school, but boy, this studio does things very, very differently. Um, but they did break from tradition compared to their previous games. So Sky is the first fully-fledged multiplayer experience that they've launched. It's going to be multi-format, coming on iOS first. Uh, the world itself is wholly online, uh, and then the game itself will touch upon uh, both aspects of non-linear story as well as more MMO-type storytelling. Uh, the big vision really is that we want to launch the game and have Sky appeal to as many people as possible, and we've tried to do that really with this next release. Sky's been in development for the last six years. Uh, it's a very long time. I don't wish six years of development and production to any of you guys in the room. Um, <laughs> there's been a lot of starts and stops, uh, U-turns, etc. Uh, and my hope today is to really share with you some of the creative processes internally at the studio, uh, providing a top-level case study and analysis of how the story had changed over the six-year period. I would say we're a team of 25. Everybody in the studio interfaces with story at some point. We're highly collaborative. Uh, but I do want to give a shout out to uh, my boss personally, Jenova Chen. He's been a true inspiration for uh, my work in this game, as well as my colleagues, Chris Bell and the design team, and Yui Tanabe and the art team. Uh, both of these guys have really put a lot into the emotion of Sky, too. So that game company, how do we best define emotional storytelling and the approach? I would say that our goal is to connect players globally through a positive emotional experience in interactive entertainment. We are an emotion-first studio. What does that mean? So for other studios, 
a green light project could look like, oh, hey, there's a new, new, uh, new piece of technology, let's explore that and green light that project. Someone has a great idea from a de design perspective, let's kind of flesh that out. Or someone might want to translate an IP, a film IP, for example, into a game, let's, let's go for it. We don't do any of that. We are very much about focusing on what that positive emotion will feel like for the audience and advocate that forward. So what that means is that we will iterate and iterate across the other uh, disciplines. So whether it's design, story, art, music, we will keep recalibrating uh, time and time again to make sure that the emotional experience is spot on. We also focus very heavily on non-competitive play. This has been kind of our domain over the past few titles. Uh, and as we push forward with our next release, we want to advocate that more genres and narrative are explored. Because if we touch upon different genres rather than the ones we've seen in the past two decades, let's say, we can possibly procure different kind of emotions uh, in the games. Uh, and what kind of you know, games and narratives can we explore that will nourish and enrich our emotional selves as a player? We want to see games accepted as an art form alongside the other forms of entertainment. So let me talk about some emotional storytelling tools uh, that we work towards at TGC. Um, let me highlight three core tenants. The first is emotion through universal language. So, you know, a lot of other developers may lean on, you know, a voiceover or a flashback or, you know, a character dialogue piece, uh, even a text kind of popping on screen to hint and maybe like explore what the exposition of the story world is. We don't do any of that. I kind of wish we did sometimes, it'll make my job easier. Um, Instead, we focus on prospectively looking towards the universal language of visual, of themes, of music. Why is that? Because if you think about these elements of language across the world, sometimes all it takes is a little piece of music to evoke a certain kind of emotion. We don't need words, we just need that piece of music. Um, and so we've kind of been developing this area a lot more and focusing on this too. I would say that our previous game journey did lean on the Joseph Campbell model of the hero's journey. Um, and with our next game, Sky, we touched upon that as we made a start on the development process. The second tenant I would like to explore is emotion through the environment. Um, you know, we're all familiar with environmental storytelling here. Uh, one of the kind of aesthetics that we've kind of approached in the past, again, with other titles like Flower and Journey, is that our artists like to work within a minimalist design space. What does that mean? So rather than try to reveal story through an object or an item or a person, we try to remove these obstacles out of the way because we feel possibly it might get in the way of the emotional interaction that we have as a player and the subject at hand. Sometimes maybe something off screen is more powerful as an emotional trigger than something that's on screen. Genova talks quite candidly about inviting players uh, into the game as though they were archaeologists. The idea that maybe backstory, a uh, hint of character, um, you know, portrayal could be buried and or hidden within the environment. Uh, it's a playground and we invite you to join uh, and kind of you know, showcase what the story could be there. It's more rewarding to unearth a piece of story item than it is just to sit and watch another cutscene. And the final tenant is uh, emotion through action. And what I mean by that is, you know, let's think about, if you can imagine, redefining what player actions and the moveset could be within a game. So if you are player A and you have a sword and you're walking around, this is an adventure game, you're wielding your sword, or you're player B, and you're carrying a candle instead. Now, I'm praying that none of you are going to be carrying the candle and pyroing the sky world once you get in, because I don't think we have enough budget to rebuild the world again. But uh, granted, the actions of each are very different, and therefore the emotions of each are going to be very, very different. So again, player A has a sword. He's going to be destroying stuff, maybe. Player B has a candle with light maybe he or she is illuminating things in the world. 
So let me talk a little bit more about Sky. What is Sky? Sky is a social adventure set above the clouds. You play as one Sky descendant of many um, that flies across this mysterious kingdom looking to spread light back into the world. The end goal is that once light is restored, the constellation will come back alive. It's a very fantastical world. Um, and very early on, we wanted to ground it um, and kind of thematically, how could we do that? Rather than portraying Sky as a fantasy game, we wanted to portray it as a coming of age game instead. We liked the idea that the character could be growing up throughout the game's time. We felt it was a very positive message to send out. We liked the inclusivity uh, of this genre too. Um, and I think the feeling that we wanted to explore also was the idea of childhood wonder as you explored this magical sky kingdom. Um, a lot of you know, us, we've all have childhoods, we understand what that means, we remember some nostalgic feelings of this world uh, and of this time. And so we wanted to leverage maybe some language and motifs around childhood. And I think that's why the uh, characters were designed as children, you play a child and you primarily remain a child through the course of the game. But this was a perfect entryway into the world that is pretty fantastical. So uh, I actually have a lot to cover, but I will focus on how story changed in, this, uh, in these three areas. Um, over the, the course of the six years, uh, I want to share with you how we adapted to a different story structure. Uh, I want to explore with you uh, how we developed an emotional engine uh, to explore the user story in the game. Uh, and finally, how we ended up testing emotion in the live community space. So the first two years of Sky, um, we had a very small team that explored prototyping the world, as you can see. We wanted to feel the way that flight could be for a player. We wanted to see how the traversal would work. We had an awesome engineering team that developed cool new technology to make the cloud robust and fun to fly within. And we also looked at the scope of gameplay as well in this early stage. For the next year or two, we started with a very small story development team. Uh, that included Genova, myself, and a couple of other artists. Uh, and there's no difference to maybe if you've, you know, if you've studied uh, writing in the past, we generated a lot of traditional story materials. And what that meant uh, is that you know, we would use a whiteboard, we would hash out what the emotional flow could be uh, at each point in the game. Uh, we developed kind of mini story bibles in Google Doc um, and drafted out what the player's background were, what the character's motives were. Um, and again, looking at the different kind of uh, pinpoints of the story that you yourself would be developing. Um, and finally, we also looked at prospectively uh, how we could visualize uh, the sky well system. But this was kind of early stages, so we wanted to kind of uh, park that until a uh, later stage. At this time, I also revisited some coming of age classics, um, uh, rewatching Wizard of Oz, Stand By Me, um, even some of the, the more kind of more recent coming of age stories, Spirited Away, um, uh, and rereading The Little Prince. That was one of the things that inspired us. So as we started moving into the development phase, this is a pretty uh, large map that the art team drew out uh, around the kind of the, the grandeur of the, the sky world. Uh, we would start out in uh, number one, around the, the Avery area and the Isle area, move to number two, which was the Prairie Realm, and then the Forest number three, so on and so forth. And we devised a multiplayer linear story path across each realm within the Sky Kingdom. Um, and then, you know, in between development, we would uh, kind of map out almost like a mini three-act structure. So for the Prairie Realm, what would happen in the first act, second act, third act, in terms of the story beats, how the player moved, what was the obstacles, uh, myself and the concept art with Genova would kind of feel these, these elements out. But a big mandate uh, from Genova was like, hey, we want players to repeat and play the game again. And I'm like, so we've already gone to number seven, so you want them to kind of start again at number one and what, play through again with the same emotional beats and the same things that are happening? Um, it was really tough to uh, justify the current kind of setting that we have. 
Um, so we kind of banked it, we put it to a side and asked ourselves, okay, so what emotions would spur a multiplayer group of people to revisit the sky world? And kind of just progressing further on each realm, we started to look at the linear progression uh, of each area. So we started with the Isle and the Prairie. Um, and the idea is, if you can think about it, the idea is, is that with each of these realms, we would uh, kind of showcase or unlock a new emotion. So let's say, for instance, you and your sky friends, you go in to the prairie area, and the idea is that this is kind of like the first burst of childhood memories. You feel freedom, you feel joy, and then you would meet a character at the end that kind of would kind of compound that emotion. Uh, and then through each realm, as we kind of navigate through all the way to the end, uh, we wanted to ultimately showcase the emotion of sacrifice. Um, now, how can we do that? So we did a quick test in the forest area, and the idea is that you and your friends would kind of fly into this enchanted forest, um, and then the further down into the woods you would get, and things aren't kind of looking so great, uh, and you actually lose your friends. This is where we separate you from the friends for the first time. Um, you would be confused, you're not really sure what's going on, you'd feel uncertain, right? This felt very contrived. It was like, I don't know how we're going to do this. We're retro-engineering and refitting emotions into levels. Um, and so, another try, another crack at emotion, we set this plan aside too. Uh, and we decided to keep some of these emotions in place for the art team to develop the look and feel of each realm, but they were kind of more like mood boards at this point. The art team also started thinking about the design of the character, um, and uh, the design team in Genova agreed that the player should really be um, uh, kind of showcased as a very plain character at the beginning, kind of going back to that minimalist design, if you will, so that you know any people jumping onto the game, they could almost connect to the avatar a lot quicker because it's not customized yet. They can kind of see themselves within that character. Um, just as your character is getting kind of, you know, all the garb and the masks as you see on the final picture, the idea is that, you know, if you visited certain lands and met certain characters, you would unlock masks, power capes, items along the way, and other people would kind of understand that, oh, hey, you've actually been to that area, I see that you have that item. Concurrently, uh, we spent some time developing the backstory. I created a lot of kind of mini documents around each of the characters, the personalities, the motives, and the concepts around these eight elder characters in the sky world that you would meet. And at this point, we leaned against the archetypes that you would see uh, in a lot of the storytelling books. Um, but it felt very cliche, even when I was writing them, the idea that, hey, here's a child of light, Look at them, they're holier than thou, they're here to help the world, and here's this, these elder dudes that have just ruined everything, and somehow they're evil. Um, I felt it was a, a very tragic story. I wanted to share that, that, f that feeling of emotion of tragedy and the history of what they'd done, how they cared about the world, and, and what happened. Uh, and so we started looking at maybe elders as anti-heroes rather than villains, I suppose. And during this time, uh, we kind of went one step further and looked at the hero's journey again. Um, I just felt like the model was doing the game a slight disservice in terms of not explaining the narrative fully. How could we account for the ranger players coming in uh, to join the multiplayer group? How can we showcase the variance of characteristics in each of the NPCs? Um, and how do we include a replayable story loop in here? Um, Conflicts was something that we looked at time and time again. Uh, we looked at stakes in the story. We went back and forth. Um, and, you know, we asked ourselves, okay, is Sky a world that's driven by conflict? Or is it a world that's driven by purpose? Do we see good and evil in this world? Or do we see and celebrate the beauty of light and dark and the duality that we are all in ourselves, light and dark? I did some additional research, and I want to share with you if you guys haven't read up on this yet. Uh, this is a new initiative called The Collective Journey uh, by Jeff Gomez, the brilliant jo uh, Jeff Gomez and his team at Starlight Runner. 
he's not trying to replace the hero's journey. He's trying to kind of add an extra layer to basically say that, hey, modern day story structure in the digital age is very different. You see it online, you see it in politics every day. People want to get involved. It's not about one person saving the world. Uh, we like this model. Uh, we like that empowered and activated communities coming together uh, in the sky world. Uh, communities that wanted to not bring down one big bad villain, but to seek systematic change that would change the world inside out. And to showcase the multiple sides and the voices that people are involved. So Genova and I, we all got excited about this TV structure of an ensemble storytelling, you know, looking at Game of Thrones, et cetera. Uh, and this side migrating into some of our, our brainstorms that we were actually now thinking more of the story as TV, episodic maybe, rather than uh, kind of one big story. So the collective journey uh, really redefined some of the emotional qualities of Sky and the nuances of our game, and it started to shift emphasis uh, towards more of a multiplayer, non-linear experience. What I like is uh, uh, points 10 and 11, the idea that in this model we're celebrating vulnerability in the character and also sacrifice, and again, we have all a part to play in this world. Again, not just one person is gonna save the day. So we now start moving into the pre-production build, and you're gonna see this map time and time again. It's getting a bit crazy there, I think. Um, but uh, kind of building off the first playthrough where we started with the Avery, the Prairie, the Forest. Uh, once as a player you've locked those areas, you can actually fly to those areas at any time. You don't have to play through the entire map to, um, to kind of get back to it. Uh, and we like this idea of zigzagging back through the different realms because it encourage group ex uh, exploration. You can go back and delve into an area of a realm that maybe you've forgotten to take a different path or maybe there's hidden uh, areas of story and items that you didn't see. And I was getting really worried at this point. I was like, I don't, I don't wanna, I wanna protect the A story. I don't wanna like start impacting and messing with that. Uh, but it actually didn't. Um, the players that, that tried the game actually enjoyed the A story mythology. They wanted to learn more. They can't wait to, to kind of finish the game and play the global release. But the B story components of seasonal content and the world events allowed a bit more of a breathing space within the world. And it really uh, pushed the design team and the story team to think a little bit more about what the core gameplay loop would be. So uh, just to track this through, what it meant was that as you travel through each realm, um, it was a looser kind of structure. Uh, the group would be you know, moving from one realm to another, solving puzzles, flying through new areas, meeting these elder characters, uh, and spreading light, right? It sounds great, it's collaborative. No, no, it wasn't. <laughs> um, <laughs> so the pre-production build, it, didn't, when we played it as a team and we did many trials, I don't think it moved us emotionally as we thought it would be. Like, we're spreading light, we're doing great things in this world. Uh, we had a lot of internal playtesters too. Uh, it was really funny, actually, in one, in one survey with a playtester, uh, a woman was playing with another woman, she was sat opposite her. And she actually thought it was all NPCs in the world at some point, and I'm just like, wow, we really have not done our job if she felt it was all NPCs in this world. So we could see the players, you know, physically traveling, traveling together through each of the realms, but they weren't emotionally connected. So if they're not going to be emotionally connected, they're not going to do the other stuff that we want to, you know, see if they, they'll be gravitating towards. The one thing that uh, did happen during some of these play tests was Genova explored uh, the element of uh, including a tool. The idea of uh, the candle, which was a breakthrough in some of the, the story work that we did. Uh, and I like the candle because it actually forges the player to have both a physical and emotional relationship uh, and connection with the world. So the idea that you would be going around lighting things, um, and, you know, uh, helping uh, the, the NPCs in the world out. But not only that, that it was connecting player on player as well. So the idea is if I have a candle and I want to hold it out to you, you have a candle that's not lit and I'm lighting your candle and giving energy uh, back to you, wouldn't that be a great thing? 
And so as we were moving uh, very sluggishly through this pre-production build, uh, we kind of, I think, had a eureka moment that, well, okay, well, we've zeroed in, we've exhausted all the emotions we can, maybe let's start looking at what an emotional engine could look like. Uh, and we focus on altruism uh, as an element and also connection as an element. What do I mean by an emotional uh, engine? So before we were looking at emotional um, moments in each of the realms and that would help drive us through and build us through to the end of the game we scrapped that we decided to focus on uh, an engine that would power the gameplay and the story through from beginning to the end the big question was was this enough really to sustain positive experience through the entire world uh, and to invite people back into the game and for them to enjoy it so uh, as we were ramping up to the beta build, we started looking at the friendship connection. This is something that you might have seen before in Journey. Uh, we started to kind of build off of that. Um, and we liked the idea of the candle moment, so uh, the team and design team started looking at how can we leverage the gifting uh, of candles to each other, the idea that you can unlock friendship functions. So if I give you three candles, uh, we can unlock the capacity to hold hands, and then I can lead you around the world and share with you some of my favorite parts of Sky. Um, or maybe you want to gift, gift me three candles, um, and then we would unlock the hugging function. Uh, people like to hug in the game. You'll, you'll see why when you play. Um, and then so on and so forth, a chat functionality and other things. It was pretty cool. We also experimented and um, pushed the needle a little bit to see, hey, you know, can we, can we leverage candle currency? Maybe people can buy candles, and you know, if they haven't you know, found a cape yet or a mask, they can leverage some of this. It's not necessarily like I will buy the candles and then I'll buy things for myself. The idea is that I will gift you candles and you can gift me candles so that you know, we have that exchange and depending on what you want to do with your candles, you can buy some, some things or unlock some things and vice versa as well. So this was the big one. Uh, we went into beta testing over a year ago um, and really you know, testing emotion at scale. Um, we had over 20,000 plus players global. As some of you guys in here, you've had a chance to check it out. Um, and these are the kind of key areas that we began to test in. So uh, what was the emotional feedback of the game, multiplayer dynamic, friendship, replay value. That's the big one. And in the beta test, uh, I would say that we kind of leveraged around six to eight builds, um, again, focusing on you know, each time, all right, what was the emotional experience of the game, and looking at the engine of uh, altruism and connection. Uh, with each of the build, we would get feedback, and then we'd slowly tweak controls, game mechanics, story, cooperative play, some of the quests in the game, and even move things around in the world if it helped you know, people to be more generous with each other. Uh, we used a tool called Firebase, which uh, sees uh, when players drop out of the game. Um, it's a terrible thing, don't use Firebase. You're just like, hey, they're having fun. Oh, no, they're not. They hate the game. Um, <laughs> And uh, we also you know, followed up each build with uh, in-game surveys. Let's find out what you think about the game. We read uh, you know, feedback on Discord, Twitter, Facebook. Uh, we opened up our inboxes to the world and said, send us your long emails. Tell us what you think, pretty please. Um, and you know, this was great. We really wanted that feedback. And so we built upon this narrative gameplay of altruism, spreading lights to the world. And this was pretty much what was in the beta build. Again, this was a time to refocus and recalibrate around friendship again. Uh, the team spent a lot of time on this area because we felt this would be the key to the replay value, um, and this was a big focus during the time. Okay, so six months to nine months of iteration, lots of qualitative and quantitative data. We're all piling, you know, reading through every team member. Um, and my God, the people were harsh on this game. Um, these are the things that we don't want to share, but here I am sharing them. Um, the, the players, as you can see, struggled uh, to understand what was going on in the game. They didn't understand the user goal. Uh, 
you know, story was unclear to them, sure, there were some placeholder cinematics. Um, some players didn't even want to help other people, they were not compelled, they were just doing their own thing and that was it. Um, and then certain, the vocal members, they were just outright rejecting multiplayer altogether, like this guy. He was like, I don't like that I'm forced to do this for some stuff. Let me be free to choose. All right, okay. Um, and we had this consistently for the first portion of the beta trials. It was very clear that we hadn't uh, built enough into the story world to earn the player's compassionate or friendship behavior. Uh, but the biggest complaint really was that players felt the friendship component of the game was imbalanced. And this is harsh because we're trying to you know, make a game that connects people, right? So, you know, one, one guy was like, you know, I'm leveraging my friendship points to unlock content and collectibles in this world. You're giving me candles, I'm giving you candles. I want your candles just to unlock the cool stuff, you know? Um, and it felt very inauthentic and at times very, very greedy. And we're TGC, we don't do greedy. I don't, I don't know how to do greedy. Um, and this was really tough on us. So uh, we took a bit of a break, we took a step back and began to shift focus and reiterate on this emotional engine uh, and try and look at different ways to represent altruism instead. Instead of building friendships around the act of altruism, could we actually leverage altruism first and then see if people come to it and then form lasting friendships? So what that meant was we didn't focus so much on the friendship building component. We just had to trust that it was going to happen. People are going to be friends in this world. We instead focused on building out moments of altruistic play uh, across the NPCs uh, and also between players. We redesigned some of the creature and civilian saving quests, uh, but you had to do it in a multiplayer uh, setting. The idea that four players would come together and, and kind of shepherd light back into, uh, into the soul of a creature. Uh, we began thinking about how we can make multiplayer more fun uh, and start designing and releasing instruments, musical instruments in Sky. Um, people loved it. Even the people that didn't like you know, to play instruments didn't know how to play it. They, they were jiving, it was awesome for them. Um, and then we started also looking at new areas in the game that had nothing to do with story. So we built out things like an ice rink. Uh, we had a crab pit. I don't know why we would have a crab pit, but there they are holding two crabs on the left. Uh, they love that area, by the way. Um, and this was just promoting, you know, friendship play. It was nothing to do with the story. Um, and the main focus is not progression through friendship, but pro progression through altruism. Uh, we talked about hugging uh, and holding hands. Those abilities became uh, unlockable very, very quickly in the game, uh, very soon after. Uh, you could just you know, spend one candle and, and you had that ability. And finally, uh, we started to look at multiplayer challenges where the players would have to protect each other during uh, certain sequences in the game. So over the next six months, uh, we found that there, uh, there was a slow uh, but somewhat drastic change in some of the player feedback we were getting. People were beginning to understand uh, some of the story elements that we were trying to get through. Um, and we were starting to see compassionate and community-driven behaviors within uh, some of the beta players. A lot of the beta players st stuck around and played the game every day. Um, and what was interesting was that they were, once they had like, you know, played all the A story content and the B story content, they were making adventures and stories on their own, unprompted. That's what they were coming back for in Sky. It wasn't necessarily the stories that we relayed to them. Um, and somehow the unexpected replay value that we've been seeking uh, all this time actually came from the players themselves. Instead of preparing content to put out into the world, the world actually had became theirs already. So it's still a work in progress, but this is kind of like the chaotic map of the different story structures we've been kind of playing around with. Uh, we still have the, the kind of main A mythology story, the seasonal event content, and then what I call the user-generated multiplayer stories uh, peppered throughout the, the world as well. Um, I want to share with you a letter that encapsulates 
what's possible with positive interactions in games. Um, and to really emphasize that the community uh, themselves has redefined the trajectory of storytelling in Sky. Uh, we owe a lot to them, um, and that's why we're working so hard to finish the game. Here's the team. They're hustling. I'm at GDC. Thank you very much. <laughs> the, global, the global release will be, uh, hopefully, with you guys very soon. Uh, so in conclusion, uh, just some tips as to how to approach uh, emotional storytelling, uh, more so in a multiplayer setting rather than a linear setting. Uh, I would advocate uh, that storytellers and developers look outside the conventional uh, tropes and structures to find and explore new ideas uh, of what emotional storytelling can be. Uh, you can't dictate emotion at any point, it's very hard. Uh, instead, experiment extensively how to uncover and reveal what this emotional engine could look like. Keep testing, keep working at it, and see what drives the player from beginning to end. That emotion might not be what you think it is. Um, treat your community very well. Their feedback is completely invaluable and probably the most authentic it can be. Um, and stay open to what uh, could be available emotionally. Um, some of the emotions we saw in the game are happy accidents and actually reveal the true nature of what Sky can be. So I started uh, the talk uh, advocating more genres of narrative in video games uh, can evoke more emotions in video games. Um, and I hope, for, you know, hope that there's some ideas that I've shared with you today that you can go back to uh, your teams or your studios to experiment with. Um, this topic's very, very uh, important to me. I wholly advocate uh, building out emotional storytelling in games. Uh, and I thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. Thank you.